Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, first of all, I will start with a brief introduction about the topic. Um, as you know, many protocols, including the standard BB84 protocol, assume that the users can emit uh, single photons. Uh, however, ideal single photon sources remain uh, very challenging to build. And therefore, uh, most implementations uh, use phase randomized attenuated laser pulses. Um, ideally, these pulses can be regarded as a statistical mixture of photon number states, uh, which means that some of these pulses will have multiple photons. And as you know, this uh, creates a problem uh, because the bits that originate from them are completely insecure uh, due to the photon number splitting attack. Uh, the best solution that uh, we have today uh, for this problem is known as the decoy state method. And uh, the great thing about it is that it allows us to recover essentially the same key rate scaling as uh, with an ideal single photon source. And this is the reason why most uh, QKD implementations and commercial systems today uh, rely on this method, especially those that deal with long distances. Um, however, the, the coisted method has a fundamental assumption, uh, which is that uh, we can ensure that the face of each pulse is independently and uniformly random. Um, in practice, uh, there are basically two approaches to try to satisfy this condition, which we can refer to as uh, passive and active. Um, uh, however, as we will see, uh, neither of them can achieve the condition perfectly, at least uh, in all circumstances. And uh, this means that the existing decoy state security proofs may not be able to guarantee the security of many uh, QKD experiments and commercial systems available today. And uh, recently we have uh, tackled this problem by developing uh, two security analysis that can uh, guarantee security with uh, imperfections in the phase randomization pr uh, process. One that targets uh, passive systems and one that targets active systems. Uh, first of all, I will uh, present our result for uh, passive systems. Uh, passive phase randomization uh, basically consists of uh, turning the laser on and off uh, in between pulses with the assumption that this will uh, completely empty the cavity of the laser and therefore each new pulse will gain a completely random phase. Um, however, experiments have shown that this is not so simple uh, because they have actually found uh, correlations uh, between the phases of consecutive pulses, uh, particularly when the sources are run at high speeds. And uh, this is believed to be the main imperfection that uh, passive randomization systems suffer from. And uh, luckily, we have been able to develop a security proof that can guarantee the security uh, in the presence of uh, these correlations. Uh, and I will present now the security proof. Uh, first of all, I will talk about the assumptions of the proof, uh, which are basically uh, two. Uh, the first assumption is that the stochastic process that determines the value of the phases has a known uh, maximum memory, uh, LC. So for example, in the simplest case, in which LC equals one, uh, this means that we have the guarantee that the value of this pulse cannot directly affect the value of this pulse, although it still, still it can affect it indirectly through its effect on the value of this pulse. And uh, the second condition is that we have a lower bound on the conditional density function of uh, each phase given information of all the previous and following phases that have information about it. And uh, the lower bound is parameterized by this Q here which uh, essentially quantifies how close the conditional distribution of each phase is to the ideal uniformly random case. Uh, given the worst case scenario in which the eavesdropper uh, holds all possible inf uh, side information that she could hold uh, about it. Uh, so now I turn about uh, the security proof. Uh, and and uh, here to prove the security rather than uh, try to do it directly, uh, we did it indirectly by first showing that the actual protocol uh, is equi actually equivalent to a scenario in which Alice's source is both characterized and independent and identically distributed. And uh, the key idea that we use to find this uh, equivalence is the following. Uh, suppose that there's some uh, single round state uh, row model and some uh, global quantum operation such that if Alice were to uh, generate many copies of raw model and then apply this global uh, operation, then she would actually get back the actual global state that she emits in the actual protocol. Uh, then if we can find this mathematical relationship, actually in the security proof, we can simply assume that Alice generates uh, many copies of this uh, state raw model and uh, that this quantum operation is simply a part of the if-controlled uh, quantum channel. And uh, this greatly simplifies the task of proving the security. And actually, we can simply 
uh, finish the security proof uh, using numerical methods uh, based on semi-definite programming. And uh, here I would like to remark that this general idea and also some important steps in the security proof uh, actually come from the thesis of uh, Shlok Nahar, uh, who is here. Um, so uh, now I will briefly present a sketch for the, this redaction, which is the main uh, step in the security proof. So uh, the first step uh, will be to divide the rounds into groups in, all, in order to guarantee independence within each group. Uh, for example, here I will consider the simplest case in which the correlation length is one. In this case, we will divide rounds into even and odd rounds. And then essentially we will treat uh, each group as its own separate subprotocol and we will prove uh, security uh, independently for each subprotocol. And uh, for example, when proving security of the even subprotocol, uh, it will be useful to assume that the odd faces are fixed to some value. And this is because uh, conditioned on this value, the states of the even rounds are actually independent from each other with uh, each of them having their own independent uh, probability distribution. Uh, the second step is to show that uh, due to assumption two, um, each of these uh, independent density functions can be expressed as a convex combination of two other uh, density functions, one that corresponds to a, a perfectly uniform uh, distribution and one that corresponds to some uncharacterized noise. And this directly implies that uh, each, uh, the state of each even round can be regarded as a statistical mixture that uh, contains a perfect phase randomized uh, coherent state. And then the third and last step is to simply define this state row model here and uh, to consider uh, an operation that uh, shifts uh, each, the, the phase of each even round according to the, its um, uncharacterized uh, noise distribution. And then one can easily show that each of these operations tends row model into the uh, appropriate uh, state of each even round. And therefore, the combination of all these operations uh, does exactly what uh, we were trying to achieve. And uh, basically, uh, using this approach, we can show that uh, we can prove the security of the even subprotocol, assuming that Alice sends states like row model uh, within the even rounds. And then uh, we can prove the same for the odd subprotocol and we can finish uh, each security proof using numerical methods and then uh, obtain a security proof for the whole uh, protocol using composability. And uh, this approach is actually generalizable for any correlation length. And not only that, but since in the end, we're always able to show that we can prove the security of each subprotocol by assuming that Alice generates states uh, that look like this. Actually, the asymptotic key rate is independent of the correlation length and it only depends on Q, which is what determines uh, how close this row model is to an ideal perfectly randomized coherent state. Um, so here are the key rates obtainable for several values of Q. And as we can see, we can still obtain pretty decent key rates for even for values of Q that are far, far from ideal, like 0 0.8. Although, of course, one may wonder what is the value of Q that we expect from actual implementations. And uh, here I have uh, some good news because in the paper we also show that the value of Q can be uh, characterized using experimental data and there's some uh, reasonable assumptions. And actually using data from a recent very high speed experiment, we obtained a uh, value uh, 0 0.99. And uh, if we see the key rate uh, obtainable for this value, uh, we can see that it's very uh, close to ideal. And this seems to suggest that uh, the coy state QKD with passive randomization is uh, pretty robust against uh, phase correlations. So uh, this is the end of the presentation about passive systems. And now QK, uh, Shoel will talk about uh, active systems. Yeah, so uh, thank you very much, Kije. Uh, now we're going to focus on the case of, uh, this does not work. Is he all right? Maybe. It's not working, apparently. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so now we focus on the case of active phase randomization. So uh, in an active uh, phase randomization scheme, we use an external phase modulator that is driven by a quantum random number generator for phase randomization purposes. Uh, this approach has been used nowadays in several applications, for example, in chip-based QQD. So it's quite important to come up with a security proof that accounts for 
experimental imperfections in the phase randomization process of an active set. This is exactly what we do in this work that I'm going to present now. So, uh, as Guillermo told us, uh, ideally, in a decoy state experiment, we will be generating uh, these phase randomized recurrent pulses, essentially. But the thing is that right from the beginning, in an ideal active scheme, we are not generated phase randomized recurrent pulses because the phase only takes one of n possible values in this interval of zero to pi. Okay. So the thing is that, uh, well, here's an example for the case of n equals four. It's really easy to understand. The thing is that uh, the security of the scenario has already been analyzed in this work uh, that was released in the year 2015. But as I was telling you, we need to go a bit further and basically incorporate imperfections that uh, might prevent the phases from being uh, evenly distributed in the interval. So what is the most general case that we can think of? Uh, so this is it, essentially. Here we have that the phase follows a certain PDF, uh, F theta, okay, that can be arbitrary for our work. And so the photon number statistics are no longer Poissonian, and the states also depend on this, uh, on this F theta quantity. As I told you, this is applicable. The analysis that I'm going to present now is applicable regardless of the exact form of the PDF. But we are going to consider here just two cases for simplicity. So the first one can be regarded as an OCE version of the, of the ideal scenario, uh, in which basically once uh, we select a certain phase setting, for example, pi over two, the phase follows a certain distribution around the phase setting. But essentially to apply this model, we need to characterize F theta. So we need exact knowledge of what F theta is. Uh, this relaxes this constraint basically because here, the only parameter that we care about is the maximum deviation between uh, the phase setting that is selected, for example, zero here, and uh, the phase that is actually emitted. We're gonna call this parameter delta max, okay? So uh, I'm not gonna go into the security proof, uh, but the thing is that right from the beginning, we would like to apply Guillermo security proof. The thing is that we cannot do that because uh, in an active setup, this condition here does not hold, okay? So we cannot find this, uh, Q's, mm, this Q parameter that should be a non-zero parameter. Because essentially in an active setup, and this really is you see, there are a lot of values of theta for which the PDF is basically zero. So uh, despite this, uh, we can adapt the security proof for the active scenario. Uh, we can combine this with certain inequalities that are based on resistance. And this, of course, you can check this in the paper. And essentially we come up with a parameter estimation technique that is based on semi-definite programming, just as Guillermo's, and that also considers basic mismatch events and that can significantly improve the performance for the ideal discretization case. And of course, it can also deal with these more realistic scenarios that I just introduced. So I'm gonna talk about the results now. Uh, let's start with the ideal active case. So here we can see that uh, uh, for a standard channel model, we get an improvement of around 10 to 20 dBs, okay? If we compare this with uh, previous works. We can also see that with n equals eight, we get uh, fairly close to the phase randomized weaker and pulse scenario. And finally, and we have tested it numerically, you cannot see this in the figure, unfortunately, but uh, the use of basic mismatch events is really useful in this low end realm, okay? And finally, for the realistic case, uh, here we assume a Gaussian distribution for the noisy version, okay? Uh, and we see that uh, the performance gets better as the standard deviation increases, and this is counterintuitive in some way, but the thing is that a, stand, a bigger standard deviation approaches the phase randomized weaker and post scenario, so the performance gets better. Uh, I'd like to remark one more time that this is just an example, okay, and this analysis is applicable regardless of the exact PDF. And finally, uh, the results for the unknown or partially known PDF case, we can see a drop in performance here, uh, even with low values of delta, of 10 to the minus three, for example. Uh, so Basically, we conclude by saying that it's very relevant to characterize this PDF uh, in practice, if this is possible, okay? So that's it. Uh, thank you for your attention, and questions now are welcome. Thank you both for the talk. Are there any questions? Can, can you go back one slide or two, two yeah, slides? Sure. This comment is intriguing, yeah, uh, uh, no, for, forward, too, too far back. Uh, the comment about, yeah, the performance increases with the standard deviation. Does, does that mean that you should, imp 
you should go in and you should make your system more noisy for your modulators that means and that, things like uh, that? Of course, if you think about it here, what we're having is uh, a certain slice in 0 to pi in which the, um, essentially we, we are assuming a truncated Gaussian distribution, okay? So the thing is that if it is very peaked, you approach the, let's say, ideal active case, right? If the, stand, if the standard deviation gets bigger, you get essentially that the phase is close to uniform in that slice. And essentially, you are approaching the phase randomized quicker in post scenario. So essentially, if you can characterize the PDF, a, big enough, a bigger sum deviation gets its better. Yeah. Okay. But I, I think you're, you are right that the ideal case is the most noisy, is the one in which the, the phase follows a, a fully uh, continuously uh, uniform distribution, which is the more noisy case. Uh, there's no phase that is uh, preferred over any other. Oh, very nice talks. So uh, I have a follow-up question for this one. So what if uh, the, the, this uh, phase kind of fluctuation is like uh, that the center is biased? For example, when you say it's zero, it's not like around zero. It could be around like a 0 .0 so 0 0.01. Yeah, so this, this is the second case, for, for instance. Okay. Here, we, essentially what you're saying is the phase can be in any piece of the slide. So let me get because here I think it's gonna be more clear to show you. Here, what we're saying is that the phase can take any value in this slice, okay? But it only takes one value and it's the same value every round. So essentially, it doesn't take pi over two, it takes pi over two plus a certain delta. And that's the value that it takes every round. But we have not tested this with a noisy version of this, so to speak. Okay. I mean, we have not tested a noisy version in which uh, the center of the distribution, the center of the Gaussian is not in pi over two. We have not tested that. Okay, I see. Uh, so in the simulation, I can see that the, you choose the m very small, like four and a five. What if yeah. m go to let's say uh, sixteen? Uh, and yeah, we have uh, the, the thing is that numerically this is very hard uh, to do. Computationally, it takes a lot of time. So we would love to go beyond n equals eight, but we have not been able to do it. <laughs> One last question for the uh, the first talk. So here, the you need. Um, in the passive uh, case, uh, you, you assume that the, the uh, phase, random, uh, phase randomized state and also the, the current state is like a block diagonalized. What if uh, like uh, you, for the passive, is that a strong assumption? Um, because you assume that there was probability P, one minus P is uh, perfectly randomized and there was probability P, it's, uh, Sorry, it's not what? randomized at all. Where, where, where is the assumption? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So uh, let me see. Yeah, let's say step three definition of row model. It is a strong assumption in this case. Uh, but but th th this is not an assumption because uh, what what we show is that uh, for any case, uh, we can uh, prove uh, that we can um, uh, prove the security uh, assuming that. Uh, Alice generates these kinds of states rather than the actual states that she, she generates. So the, the only assumptions that we have are, are uh, these two, that uh, we, we know the maximum correlation length and that we know uh, how close to uniform each phase is given all other phases that have information. And uh, given these two assumptions, we can show that we can prove the security uh, assuming that Alice actually generates these states uh, which are characterized unlike the actual source.